Hello my beautiful watchers. So, the last thing on the videos I will never do list hath fallen. I came to the realization that I was never going to feel ready to cover The Lord of the Rings in a full comprehensive lost in adaptation format, but there's nothing wrong with covering more specific topics within that content. Huzzah! I am not going to waste anyone's time with the usual lengthy intro talking about the writers and filmmakers. Y'all know that Tolkien published The Fellowship of the Ring in 1954, defining the fantasy genre for 70 years and counting, and Peter Jackson directed its live-action adaptation in 2001, creating one of the most acclaimed films of all time. A Fellowship is an almost unique instance of being an amazing book and an amazing film, as well as being a shining example of how to adapt one to the other without losing the core themes. However, with a reasonably sized book, part of that adaptation process is always going to involve letting some stuff go to fit the runtime and the different pacing required to make a well-structured film. I'm certain some trimmings were easier than others. There's a lot of songs and a lot of long descriptions of good meals that audiences probably didn't miss, but there were a few characters from the book that were pretty memorable that didn't make the cut as well, and one in particular that I personally feel was a great loss, because they were cool as hell and I am going to tell you all about them. And as I've already given away in the thumbnail, despite popular belief, it is not Tom Bombadil. I'm not saying old Tom isn't a cool character, it's just that he's kind of confusing. Bombadil has the outward appearance of a man, shorter than most humans, but taller than a hobbit. He was described as having a rosy red face that was creased with laughter lines, bright blue eyes, and a long brown beard. He dressed in bright yellow boots, a blue coat, and an old hat with a long blue feather stuck in it. He's an immensely jovial person, appearing to be pleased and amused by literally everything. He often speaks in rhyme, or at least in a very poetic way, and regularly bursts into cheerful songs, and it's part this relaxed and groovy disposition that makes him such a memorable character from the book. For you see, there's a huge juxtaposition between his apparent power level and his carefree goofiness, because he is, for all intents and purposes, a demigod. In a world of dark lords, stone-faced wizards, and ethereal elves, all locked in a deadly struggle to decide the fate of the planet, the heroes are suddenly face to face with a guy more magical and ancient than all of them, who is just kind of bopping around in the woods, having a good time, and singing about how awesome his wife is. And Tolkien intentionally left what the smegging hell this guy's deal is very ambiguous, but what scraps of info we are given are kind of mind-blowing. Making his first appearance in Book 1, Chapter 6, Tom immediately deus ex machinas the hobbits out of a deadly situation. Not long into their journey to Rivendell, the four lads that set out from the Shire were attempting to travel through a place called the Old Forest, a wood that, kind of like the depths of Mirkwood that Bilbo had to navigate, is a region populated with ancient trees who possess wills of their own and harbour a deep malevolence to all men and beast, creating an oppressive atmosphere that gets into their minds and drives them to the spare. While passing under a particularly large willow tree next to a stream, the hobbits were struck down by an irresistible magical fatigue. Sam, the little badass that he is, is the only one able to resist it, while the other three fall asleep against the trunk, which promptly pulls Merry and Pippin inside and uses a root to try to drown Frodo. He manages to free Frodo, but they can't get Merry and Pippin out. When they attempt to threaten the tree with fire, it starts to crush its prisoners, and Merry screams that it's talking to him, telling him that if they don't put it out, it will kill him then and there. So, as the two panicked hobbits can do nothing but scream for help as their friends are slowly squeezed to death, trapped in a wooden vice that whispers its dark intentions into their ears, and all hope seems lost, they suddenly hear singing and Tom Bombadil struts his funky stuff into the scene. When the hobbits explain what's happening, he's only mildly concerned. Leaning in close, he sings something to the tree, then steps back, commands it to go to sleep, and Merry and Pippin are suddenly free. Then, as was the case with many of the hobbits' favorite hosts on the journey, he took them back to his place for a huge meal and a long rest, and at his relatively humble forest home, they met his hot wife, Goldberry, who also seems quite nice. The next and even more surprising twist that Bombadil springs on the Hobbits is that the Ring, the physical embodiment of Salvon's power, hate, and will, has zero power over him. He can see people while they're wearing it, when he puts it on he doesn't vanish, and most importantly, he feels absolutely no desire to own it. This is the thing that Gandalf didn't dare touch for fear he wouldn't be able to resist it. The thing Galadriel was so torn up over turning down, she went into a Super Saiyan meltdown. 
the thing that literally the entire world is tearing itself apart to get at, and it might as well be something found in a box of cereal for all Tom cares about it. Even Tom himself and his wife appear to be unable or more likely unwilling to explain who he is even when directly questioned. Goldberry simply responds, he is, and Tom... Eh, what? said Tom, sitting up, his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself and nameless? But you are young and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friend. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already. Before the seas were bent, he knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless. Before the Dark Lord came from outside. So, if he is to be believed, only two things are even remotely clear about him. Firstly, he is a being like no other. There's nothing to compare him to, and no race he can be assigned to. He is simply Tom Bombadil. And secondly, he is old. Like, crazy old. Like, the dawn of time old. Many people believe the Dark Lord he's referring to isn't Sauron, but his old boss Melkor, which would mean Tom predates the First Age, which, in defiance of all logical naming conventions, was not the first of the ages. One of the most popular theories is that he is the embodiment of the land. He came into being with it because he is it. He is the spirit of the Earth of Middle-earth. Regardless, Tom is so well known for being an uber-powerful being, he was brought up during the Council of Elrond as a possible person to give the ring to, to keep it away from Sauron when he inevitably sent his armies out of Mordor. This idea was rejected because Gandalf knew that Tom was so far above the goings-on of Middle-earth, there wouldn't be a way to convince him to take the ring seriously. He would almost certainly lose it somewhere simply because he gave so few shits. On a more somber note though, it was mentioned that if Sauron eventually took over the rest of Middle-earth, even Tom, as powerful as he was, would not be able to withstand him forever. He would be the last person in Middle-earth to die, just as he was the first to live. One thing I personally like about him is how crazy into his wife he is. He's basically the John Mulaney of Middle-earth. He talks and sings non-stop about how amazing she is and, without fail no matter what, always goes back to the pond where they first met to collect lilies for her on their anniversary. Tom Bombadil, non-toxic masculine role model. And yeah, obviously we don't know what Goldberry's deal is either, though one has to assume she's also an ancient immortal being to be, you know, Mrs. Bombadil. There's probably several pretty simple reasons for Tom's omission from the film. Peter Jackson has stated the most obvious. Bombadil lent himself to being one of the things cut out for brevity's sake by being utterly pointless to the story in the grand scheme of things. His part of the book, while mildly trippy, did nothing to advance the story. I can also understand the urge to cut him out simply because he's so OP, he would have been kind of world-breaky. Yes, they do establish he wouldn't have been the solution to everything, but one only has to look at how many people drone on and on about the bloody eagles to know there would have been terabytes of galaxy brain think pieces online about how Tom could have been better utilized. Okay, well, you were forewarned about Bombadil, so I'm sure you're still trying to guess who is this coolest character of whom I speak so highly. Perhaps you are thinking, Well, Dom, you beautiful pinnacle of evolution, are you referring to the Barrow White? Put bluntly, the Barrow White is a terrifying ghost that wants to murder you and steal your body. Yes. The very next place the hobbits stumble into after parting from Tom Bombadil was Turn Gorthad, also known as the Barrow Downs, a large stretch of land covered with ancient burial mounds, tombs of kings and queens of the First Age, thousands of years old. This area had once become the seat of power for a mighty nation of the Dúnedain, but the unlucky chappies were eventually laid low by the forces of the Witch King and further decimated by a horrific plague. Apparently not content to just destroy everything, the Witch King chose to go full roam Carthage on his enemies and salt the earth, which in the Lord of the Rings universe involves sending a ton of ghosts who haunt the ancient graves and kill anyone who ever tries to resettle the area. The hobbits make the mistake of taking a rest, leaning up against an unusually cool rock, and end up falling into an unexpected and 
ill-advised nap. They wake up to find themselves surrounded by thick white fog. Sensing imminent danger, they try to escape the area but are picked off one by one until only Frodo remains. Where are you? He cried again, both angry and afraid. <sighs> Said a voice, deep and cold, that seemed to come out of the ground. I am waiting for you. No! Said Frodo, but he did not run away. His knees gave and he fell to the ground. Nothing happened, and there was no sound. Trembling, he looked up, in time to see a tall, dark figure like a shadow against the stars. It leaned over him. He thought there were two eyes, very cold though lit with a pale light that seemed to come from some remote distance. Then a grip, stronger and colder than iron, seized him. The icy touch froze his bones, and he remembered no more. Huh. I didn't realize until now just how often this plot involves these little buggers getting magically roofied. Anyway, Frodo awakens in one of the barrows and one of the more overtly horror-themed scenes in the trilogy. The elegant treasure-filled tomb was lit with a faint green glow, enough to see that he and his friends had been undressed while they were unconscious, you creepy fucking ghost, then dressed again in white robes, blinged out in golden jewels, and laid on the ground in a row with a sodding sword laying across their throats. The Barrow White starts singing an incantation, and to Frodo's horror, from around the corner a long pale arm appears and begins reaching for the handle of the sacrificial blade. Okay, I know this is a, a bad moment, but I have to go tie my hair up because this is getting ridiculous. I would love to say that was to build tension, but it really wasn't. Where was I? Uh, oh yes, as it is mere inches away from cutting the hobbit's throats, Frodo, in an act of incredible courage, seizes a short sword and slices the hand right off, though disturbingly it still flops around on the floor for a bit of its own accord. With whatever the effect that thing was defeated, Frodo still doesn't know how to deal with the white, but fortunately they're still within the Tom Bombadil Deus Ex Machina Sorval zone, so Frodo summons him with a magic song he taught them, and he immediately appears and wham, uses his bombadilness to banish the white from Middle Earth before taking the hobbits outside and destroying the entire barrow. Peter Jackson and the writers claim that this had to be sacrificed for the same reason as Bombadil, for the sake of time and because it didn't progress the story. Again, I think this is reasonable though this time in the process the film lost just a little bit of character development that was important to Frodo. It was a huge leap forward for him in displays of courage that he resisted his first instinct to put on the ring and escape and instead chose to stay behind and save his friends by fighting the horrors that threatened them. And there's also something to be said for its omission confusing the origin of Merry's sword and the role it played in the demise of the Witch King, but that's not a 100% confirmed theory and could probably be avoided by simply claiming that Aragorn got these swords that he provided the hobbits with from my barrow. So, is the Barrow White the answer to the big question? No, of course not. Come on, people. The Barrow White? I mean, that part of the book is pretty suspenseful, to be fair, but saying it's the coolest thing from the book is stretching it. Once again, I shall predict the direction your cunning minds are moving, my beautiful watchers. Verily, the words are forming even as I speak. Okay, Dom, you tasty full English breakfast. Not the Barrow White, that was always a bit of a long shot, but I am unpatrolled disturbed in my guesswork. Are you talking about Radagast the Brown? If you haven't read the books, but have seen Radagast in the Hobbit trilogy, just, uh... Look, Sylvester McCoy is cool, but the depiction of Radagast was prominent amongst the frustrating choices made in those adaptations. Book readers might be of the opinion that I'm stretching the term from the book a bit, because Radagast was only mentioned in a post hoc recounting by Gandalf, as opposed to directly featuring. You don't even get a physical description of him outside of the posthumously published Unfinished Tales of Numenor and Middle-earth, though it is probably safe to assume that he was colour-coded like all of the other wizards. Regardless though, hear me out because I I still think he's worthy of some discussion. Like all the wizards, Radagast was originally an Einar, a race of angel-like beings that were created at the beginning of the universe. Awindil, as he was known back then, was part of the less powerful Maya, who served the greater of their race, the Valar, and was selected by them to take corporeal form in Middle-earth to assist in its defense against the up-and-coming threat of Sauron. However, over time, Radagast became a somewhat timid and unassuming wizard compared to contemporaries like Saruman and Gandalf, and rarely traveled or got involved 
involved in anything if he could avoid it. His powers mainly resided in his ability to communicate with the wild animals that he spent most of his time with. His role in the War of the Ring was, unfortunately, being an unwitting pawn of Saruman. The head honcho wizard sent an unsuspecting Radagast to find Gandalf and tell him to come to Isengard ASAP with promises of help against the re-emergence of Sauron, knowing Gandalf would be more trusting of an invite delivered by one of his oldest friends. Saruman hoped that Gandalf would assume that Radagast was in on the deception, but Gandalf just couldn't bring himself to doubt the goodness of his friend for long. He was just such a sweet cinnamon roll of a wizard. Fortunately for Radagast's legacy, things kind of balanced out in the end because, even though he unwittingly got Gandalf captured, he also unwittingly rescued him. As they parted ways, Gandalf had the bright idea to ask Radagast to use his ability to talk to animals to ask them to do some reconnaissance for the good guys. Saruman had a very low opinion of Radagast and was openly scornful of his gentle ways and love of animals, so he didn't consider him worth the effort of capturing or neutralizing. That was the undoing of Saruman's plot, for Radagast knew no reason why he should not do as I asked, and he rode towards Mirkwood where he had many friends of old. And the eagles of the mountain went far and wide, and they saw many things. The gathering of wolves, and the mustering of orcs, and the nine riders going hither and thither in the lands, and they heard news of the escape of Gollum. And they sent a messenger to bring these tidings to me. And so it was that when summer waned, there came a night of moon, and grey here the wind lord, swiftest of the great eagles, came unlooked for to Orthanc, and he found me standing on the pinnacle. Then I spoke to him, and he bore me away before Saruman was aware. This is noteworthy in three ways. Firstly, it means that it's book accurate that if Saruman had just locked Gandalf in a room instead of on the roof like a fucking drama queen, he wouldn't have been able to escape. Secondly, it was a good example of one of the core themes in the Lord of the Rings, that the defeat of the powerful comes not through matching them with equal power, but through the honesty and goodness of the humble. And thirdly, I just need to express that it is a little weird to me that Peter Jackson's substitution for Radagast was a moth. Just a moth. You know, I I'm not complaining because it's still a really awesome scene, but I just don't get how you get from here to here. That he was cut out is almost certainly because of how small a role in the story he ultimately played. Introducing him as a character probably wouldn't have been worth the runtime for the payoff. So, all that considered, in answer to your suggestion, no, you fools, you damn fools, how could you be so blind? You wound me with your short-sightedness. Radagast was a nice touch of world-building, but that's all. So minor and unassuming a character could never hold the title of coolest. But, hmm, I foresee you are undaunted by this revelation, my beautiful watchers. No doubt you were one step ahead of me this whole time. Under your breath you mutter, Ha ha, Dom, you Adonis, you demigod amongst men. I knew all along that Radagast was an obvious red herring in this investigation, but enough tomfoolery. It's time for the real answer, for surely it has to be Glorfindel. Making his first shiny appearance in Book 1, Chapter 12, Glorfindel was an elf, but my dude was not just any elf. Like most of his kind, he was a total hottie. Tall and straight, hair of shining gold, his face fair, young, fearless, and full of joy. He had a sexy pair of bright eyes, a voice like music, on his brow set wisdom, and in his hands was strength. Most of that is a verbatim description, so damn. Glorfindel was born back in the Years of the Trees, which is one of the before-mentioned eras before the First Age, which puts him roughly on par with Galadriel age-wise, give or take a few millennia. He eventually became the head of the House of the Golden Flower, a prominent house in the city of Gondolin, one of the last great realms of the elves. I can't go into too much detail, but it sounds like it was a pretty sick place to hang, until it was destroyed by Melkor, now named Morgoth, and his army of orcs and balrogs. Even once the walls fell, Glorfindel and his house put up an incredible fight, only being driven back when a motherfucking dragon showed up and tore up the street they were fighting in. After defeat became certain, Glorfindel took up the rear guard to protect the fleeing refugees, and ended up having to duke it out with a balrog one-on-one, -on -one, in a scene that might sound somewhat familiar. Then Glorfindel leapt upon him, and his golden armor gleamed strangely in the moon, and he hewed at that demon that it leapt upon a great boulder, and Glorfindel after. Now there was a deadly combat upon that high rock above the folk, and these, pressed behind and hindered ahead, were grown so close that well nigh all could see, yet it was over ere Glorfindel's men could leap to his side. 
The ardour of Glorfindel drove that Balrog from point to point, and his mail fended him from its whip and claw. Now he had beaten a heavy swing upon its iron helm, now hewn off the creature's whip arm at the elbow. Then sprang the Balrog in the torment of his pain and fear at Glorfindel, who stabbed like the dart of a snake, but he found only a shoulder, and was grappled, and they swayed to a fall upon the cragtop. Then Glorfindel's hand sought a dirk, and this he thrust up, that it pierced the Balrog's belly nigh his own face, for that demon was double his stature, and it shrieked and fell backwards from the rock, and falling, clutched Glorfindel's yellow locks beneath his cap, and those twain fell into the abyss. Now, quite reasonably, you might be wondering, how the heck can he be a character left out of the Fellowship of the Ring if he died fighting a Balrog thousands of years before? Well, it turns out that Glorfindel, and his heroic death, was so fucking boss, when he got to the afterlife, the Valor in charge decided to give him another go, resurrecting him and sending him back to Middle-earth. After a few more millennia of him kicking about being a total badass, we finally come to the Third Age and the War of the Ring. Glorfindel crosses paths with the story when the Hobbits are being led by Aragorn on the final stretch of their journey to Rivendell, after Frodo was stabbed with the Morgul knife. Glorfindel came face to face with three Nazgûl on a bridge, and I kid you not, they ran the heck away. Oh. Fuck, it's Glorfindel. Cheese it, boys! Two more riders get the hell out of his way before he finds the party, and after wowing them with his sex appeal, he puts Frodo on his horse. It's a very good horse, which is fortunate because shortly later the black riders show up in force and he has to make a mad dash to the ford that marks the boundary of Rivendell. In case you haven't figured it out yet, it's Arwen. The reason that Glorfindel is not in the film is because they gave his role to Arwen, with the notable difference that Glorfindel didn't ride with Frodo. The young hobbit actually drew his sword and stood up to the wraith solo, another example of that hobbit's more overt courage that the film misses out on. While I am glad that the filmmakers made an obvious attempt to remedy Tolkien's lack of interesting roles for women in his novels, I don't think it's fair to say this was the only reason for this switch around. Arwen's role in the book was admittedly pretty minuscule, but she's still slightly more relevant than Glorfindel, who never features in the story again. There was some suggestion that he might have been one of the members of the Fellowship if one of the Hobbits had wanted to go home, but they didn't, so the next and only time his name comes up is when he's boarding the ship to the Grey Havens in Return of the King. Like all the people mentioned before, Glorfindel was a wonderful piece of world building on Tolkien's part, one of the many characters, locations, or things that only touched the story momentarily and whose rich history appeared only in supplementary works, but because Tolkien put in all that effort into creating and chronicling that backstory, he brought a feel of realness with him that helped make Middle-earth amazing. But even even an extended edition of a film has only so much time, so yeah, you're probably gonna have to shift a few plot beats to characters who are in the plot more than once. There was some suspicion within the Tolkien fandom for a while that Glorfindel was so cool there had to be some sort of mistake, and wondered if the Glorfindel that died fighting the Balrog and the Glorfindel that appeared in Fellowship might be two different elves that happened to have had the same name. However, in one of his posthumously published essays, Tolkien himself confirmed that it was the same guy. The same really cool guy. So cool, in fact, you could say he's the coolest character left out of the Fellowship of the Ring. If there wasn't one character even cooler than him. That's right, my beautiful watchers. You've fallen for my smoke and mirrors routine one last time, you poor souls. You, you dirty boys. Or I should never ad-lib. But the moment has arrived. We've considered the runners-up, but at last it is time to talk about the biggest badass to be cruelly neglected by Peter Jackson. Farmer Maggot. But wait, Dom, he was in the film. He was credited in everything. No, how dare you suggest this sniveling coward is Farmer Maggot. Look at him quivering in his hobbit boots and selling out Frodo. I hate him, get him off my screen, hashtag not my maggot. No indeed, I assure you, the film only crowd has never met Farmer Maggot. In Book 1, Chapter 4, the heroes learned that when Gollum tipped off Sauron that the ring was in the Shire, the Nine rode out of Mordor, and when they arrived to find that all the hobbits by the name of Baggins had recently left, they demanded answers about where he had gone and tried to intimidate the hobbits on the outskirts of the Shire into helping them catch him. Unfortunately for them, they chose to try this bullshit on Farmer Motherfucking Maggot. I come from yonder, he said, slow and stiff-like, pointing back over west, over my fields if you please. Have you seen Baggins? 
He asked in a queer voice and bent down towards me. I could not see his face for his hood fell down so low and I felt a sort of shiver down my back. But I did not see why he should come riding over my land so bold. Be off, I said. There were no Bagginses here. You're in the wrong parts of the Shire. You'd better go back west to Hobbiton, but you can go by road this time. Baggins has left, he answered in a whisper. He is coming. He is not far away. I wish to find him. If he passes, will you tell me? I will come back with gold. No, you won't, I said. You'll go back to where you belong, double quick. I'll give you one minute before I call my dogs. Farmer Maggot told a Nazgul to fuck off right to his face. A lone hobbit looked up at a black rider, one of the nine corrupted kings and sorcerers who served as the right hand of Sauron, towering over him on his horse and told him to get off his land. Considering his height, it makes it doubly amazing he could walk around with kahunas that size. Frodo and his friends turned up almost immediately afterwards, so Maggot gave them a good meal and smuggled them to the ferry in his cart to keep them safe without a shred of concern for the fact that he was going to be riding home solo in an area filled with enemy horsemen. While one could make the case that these things pale in comparison when compared to the achievements of Glorfindel, I say it's one thing to be a total badass when you're an immortal elf, gifted with perfect physical prowess and who's been honing his combat skills since the dawn of time, but it's an entirely different achievement to laugh in the face of danger when you're five foot tall and at best armed with a scythe and a dog. Now if his overwhelming courage wasn't enough to convince you that this guy's a fecking legend, he still has Tom Bombadil to vouch for him. The the oldest and quite possibly one of the most powerful beings in Middle-earth respected the hell out of Farmer Maggot. The old guy was more interested in him than he was in Sauron. So there you have it, my beautiful watchers. Farmer Maggot, the coolest character from the Fellowship of the Ring who didn't make it into the film, I swear to Eru, if you show me that pretender again, I will run you through. There are no doubt some characters you feel should have made it onto this video as well, so feel free to mention them in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know with likes and comments so I'll know that you want to see more like it. It's been a lot of fun finally diving into Lord of the Rings content, but I want to know if you guys are digging it too. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe so you can find your way back for more content. If you like watching my videos as soon as they come out, be sure to click the bell because apparently YouTubers decided people who don't probably don't need to know about fresh uploads at all. Do be sure to check out my Patreon page for content that can't be on YouTube anymore. Oh, and on a related note, if you regret missing out on last week's q and I run a Discord server where I can chat with and answer Patreon questions all year round. And finally, please take care of yourselves out there in these troubled times, and I hope to see you next time. <clears throat> Fucking love this sword. In a field full of shrooms with a dog and a hoe is the most badass hobbit that you'll ever know. Feet in the mud, sturdy as a brick. He scared off a Nazgul with his big swinging dick. He's Farmer, Farmer, farmer Maggot. What a fucking shot! He's Farmer, Farmer, farmer Maggot. God, I wish that Hobbit was my dad. You know, like, platonically. Look, I just respect him, okay? Don't make it weird. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Sattel Spurtloff, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Il Nej for performing this awesome tune, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. She does some really amazing work on her channel that I think you would really enjoy, so be sure to check that out too. Percy Jackson... <laughs> Peter Jackson. <laughs> Percy Jackson, director of The Lord of the Rings, is a very multi-talented lad. So, once again, I shall predict the ere erection? Oh my goodness. Now Wispy's using the bloody scratching post. Come on, boys. Wispy, will you're usually the quiet one.